By no means is it over. We can hack human beings and other organisms. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds. But you, the real you, your intelligence, your memory, your personality is going to live forever and ever. According to the Bible, you will never die. So the moment you bend your body for yoga, you are practicing Hindu. Elon Musk has now taken over Twitter. Pope says he wants everyone on Earth to show in the battle against no. climate change. No. Free will, that's over. That's For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Uh, it was quickly signed by 10,000 medical and public health scientists. 40,000 uh, doctors, nurses, etc. And by now we have over 900,000 uh, signatures from members of the public from all uh, over the world. And there was nothing novel in this declaration. This is all basic principles of public health that we have known about for decades and uh, a century. Uh, but there was an attempt by uh, Anthony Fauci and other leaders uh, in other countries to create the impression that there was scientific consensus for lockdowns, and there never was. When I talked to my colleagues and epidemiologists, privately, most of them agreed with me. So there was nothing novel in this document. What did make a difference was there were three of us, so it's harder to dismiss three people than one person. Also, we all worked in infectious disease epidemiology. So nobody can say that we didn't know the field. And we were all at reasonably respectable universities, Stanford, Harvard, and Oxford. So they were unable to ignore uh, this when it came out in October. So why is the, what is the basis for this? And what is, why was the, the, what went wrong with how we addressed this pandemic? Well, it violated the principles of public health. And one of those principles is that public health is not about one disease. It's about our health in general. So we can't just focus on COVID and try to minimize that. And then people will not get the care they need for diabetes or their cancer screening or cancer treatment or their cardiovascular disease uh, or mental health has deteriorated. So we also always have to consider uh, what effect our public health measures has on, on other diseases. So for example, now uh, people, maybe a woman didn't get the, her, her cervical cancer screening as she should have, and now she will, uh, that, that doesn't have an immediate effect uh, on, on, on mortality, but maybe she now will live only three more years instead of another 15, 20 years. So these effects on other aspects of public health, other diseases, is something that we're going to live with and die with for decades to come. Mental health has been deteriorating. In the summer of 2020, 25, around 25% of young uh, people had suicidal ideation, thinking about suicide. Another principle of public health is that we have to look at it long term and not short term. So yes, we can all go and hide, and then we will postpone getting COVID, but eventually it will come. We can never, it's not like a hurricane that you can go in the basement and hide, and two days later it's over, you can go up and the sun is shining. That doesn't work, that's not the same thing infectious diseases operates. So you can postpone it a little bit, and there's one reason for that, because you don't want everybody to get sick at the same time, but, uh, 
when you postpone it, you're just prolonging all the, the collateral damage. And uh, it's, higher to, uh, it's harder to protect those older, high-risk people from COVID because you had to do it for a longer time period. There was only one major Western country who did not go down this route of, uh, of lockdowns. So that was Sweden. Uh, for example, uh, schools were open throughout 2020 for all children ages 1 to 15. Uh, do you know, uh, uh, during this uh, first wave in 2020, in that spring, of, of the 1.8 million children in Sweden who all went to school or daycare, do you know how many of those 1.8 million people died, children died of COVID? Zero. Yes, zero. And there were a few hospitalizations, but uh, they all survived. And we can see here that uh, if you look at excess mortality, Sweden has one of the lowest excess mortalities in, in Europe, and actually by now is actually the lowest. This, this uh, data is a little bit old from, from last year, but by now it's, it's the lowest among all, all major Western countries. Uh, also, public health is about everyone. Lockdowns were fine for the laptop class, work from home, uh, or from the, bed, from the bed. So it protected young low risk members of the laptop class, while uh, uh, working class people and middle class people, they had to work uh, as a supermarket clerk or as uh, driving the cab and, and so on. And we can see here that uh, this is from Toronto. In the very beginning, more poor neighborhoods has had sort of an, an increased risk about the same, but then when the lockdowns came, uh, we had a lot of COVID in the, in the poor neighborhoods, but not so much in the rich neighborhoods. So we were protecting young professionals who were at very low risk while exposing older people who, um, uh, who were at risk. This is from uh, Los Angeles, another example. We can see that uh, the, the more poverty is more COVID or more mortality. Another thing is that public health is both local and global, and it has to be adopted to the needs of each population. One of the most tragic aspects of lockdowns was that in Africa, Asia, Latin America, many poor people starved to death because of the lockdown. So they, uh, uh, for example, uh, the family will sell their food products in the market, and that's for their daily income, but now they could, the market was closed and they couldn't feed their children. Uh, in India, when there was a lockdown, the poor people who were selling, living day to day on, on the street selling things, they would sell things one day and then whatever they made, they would buy things to sell next year plus a little bit of food. They was closed down. They had to walk home to their ancestral villages, which could be several days of walking, and many didn't make it home. So this is very, one very tragic aspect of, uh, of, uh, of, these, of these lockdowns. In public health can be reduced, but it can never be eliminated. This idea that we should have zero COVID is just crazy. We can't do that. When there's a pandemic, some people are going to die from it. That's unavoidable. So the goal is to minimize death. We cannot eliminate it completely. That just uh, makes uh, uh, other aspects of public health so much worse. Paul was singing this uh, earlier today very beautifully about love and fear. And uh, that quote from Timothy is, uh, well, I have many favorite quotes from the Bible, but that's one of them and one I have, that I have, uh, have thought about a lot during this pandemic. And I even tweeted the, that uh, quote once. But it's also a principle of public health, because if you have public health, it's based on trust. And it's a two-way street. If public health officials and public health agencies want the public to trust them, then public health also has to trust the public. It doesn't work otherwise. So COVID was bad. Uh, uh, it killed many older people. But the COVID panic, I think, was worse, the fear.
Here was a survey in the summer of 2020. How many do you believe have died from COVID? In the US, US people thought that 9% of the population had died from COVID. In the UK, they thought uh, they were a little bit closer to the truth. They thought 7% had died from COVID. That's more than 100 times the truth. So people were fearful of this much more than they uh, should have been. And it was actually especially people thought that young people were dying from this, which was not true. That was very, very, very rare. And the government actually was deliberately uh, stirring this fear, trying to create more fear so that people will obey, obey the restrictions. So in ages 18 to 24, 58% of them were feared significant health consequences if they became infected with the virus. There was mi minuscule risk to them from the, this virus. My daughter had COVID when she was five years old and uh, because she was tested uh, in school because somebody else had it. And uh, she took a nap that Sunday. That was a little tired, she took a nap. That was her only symptom from COVID. So, so this was not a dangerous thing for, for children, uh, and less dangerous than the, than the annual influenza uh, we have. Also, in, in uh, public health and in medicine, it should, not, it should be based on uh, informed consent and be voluntary, not coercion. That's partly for philosophical and ethical reasons, but it's also for practical reasons that uh, if you try to force something, I don't know, have any of you had a teenager at home at ever, ever? If you try to force them to do something, that might not be the most best strategy to actually uh, uh, convince them to do something. And I think it's the same in public health. Also, public health must always be honest and transparent. And both with those things that are unknown and the things that are not known. And any advice should be evidence-based, based on data and analysis. And if there are errors made, that should be acknowledged. Here's one example. Uh, immunity after having the COVID vaccine versus immunity after having had COVID, so so-called so, so national immunity. Well, uh, this, was, this was one of the first studies. There have been many other studies not confirming this, but if you have, are vaccinated, you are 13 times higher risk of uh, being tested positive for COVID than if you've had COVID before you are 27 times more likely to have symptomatic disease than if you have had COVID before. And eight times more likely to be hospitalized. Uh, death, uh, there was zero in both groups. So both groups were here very well protected against death. Uh, but uh, having had COVID give you better immunity than having had the vaccine. And that's natural because the vaccine is sort of trying to imitate our own immune, immune response. That's the sort of the whole, uh, that's the whole, the basis of vaccines. So how long have we known about this natural immunity, do you think? Well, we've known it since 430 BC during the Athenian plague, uh, where uh, 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 Tucydides uh, wrote the history of the Peloponnesian Wars, and he mentioned that uh, during the Athenian plague, if you've already had it, uh, you could take care of other, uh, other uh, friends or citizens because you couldn't get it again. Uh, so once you survived it, you survived. Um, so it's pretty astonishing that our CDC director questions national immunity, which he did in an article in Lancet. It's pretty astonishing that Presidents of universities are forcing young students who have already had COVID to take the vaccine because they are de facto denying national immunity. Uh, how long do you think we have known that the earth is round rather than flat? About two and a half thousand years. So, so about the same amount of times that we have known about national immunity. So uh, I think that when university professors 
do this vaccine mandate, uh, they are denying something that we know so well for, and they might as well consider the Earth to be flat. Uh, I think it's the same scale of things when they do that. Also, public health scientists and practitioners should also avoid conflicts of interest. And if there are conflicts of interest, they should be clearly stated. It's also important to have open, civilized discussions uh, about a pandemic and science. There should be no censoring, there should be no slandering or bullying of people who think things differently. That uh, silences debate, and this has to do with with fear again. If, if people are censored or slandered, they're going to be afraid to speak up. And I have many colleagues who, who, who are afraid to speak up during the pandemic. Uh, Anthony Fauci sits on the biggest pile of research money for infectious disease scientists in the world. So if you say something against him, um, that uh, you, you might lose your funding. You may lose your, your place in academia. Four days after the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, the director of NIH, or the National Institute of Health, uh, so which is the boss of Anthony Fauci, because Anthony Fauci was the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infect, uh, uh, Infectious Diseases, which is part of the NIH. So uh, Dr. Collins wrote that uh, CGB declaration, this proposal from three fringe epidemiologists, I'm one of those fringe technologists uh, who met uh, with the secretary, that was Secretary Asa, who was the secretary of, of, of uh, Department of, of Health under Trump, is getting a lot of attention. Uh, there needs to be a quick and devastating published takedown of its premises. I don't see anything like that is that underway. So they didn't want to discuss this with us and see what ideas we have for better protecting older people, for example. They just wanted a, a, a devastating takedown. Uh, this is what uh, uh, Anthony Fauci responded. I'm pasting below a piece from Wired magazine that debunks this theory. Uh, this is by Matt Reynolds, who's a journalist. So I guess he's much more knowledgeable about infectious disease technologies than for example, Dr. Sneta Grupta, who in my view is the preeminent infectious disease technology in the world. Uh, but uh, he covers climate, food, and biodiversity. Uh, but of course, he knows more about, uh, at least uh, Tony Fauci uh, relies, he thinks that he's more reliable on this matter than, than, than we are. And later, Fauci equated the three of us as with people who are denying uh, AIDS. And there was uh, other such type of slander, which is sort of okay. And you expect to have it from like some random dude on Twitter. But when it comes from other scientists, it's a little bit surprising, I think. Um, we, we were also censored. So I guess I'm going to give some example for, from, from Twitter. Uh, I got a question. Do you think younger age groups or people who have already had the virus need to be vaccinated? I don't know who this person is. So it's just some random person on Twitter who asked, uh, a question, I think I should, I should respond. That's the responsible thing to do. So I said, no, thinking that everyone must be vaccinated is as scientifically flawed as thinking that nobody should. COVID vaccines are important for all the high-risk people. Those with prior natural immunity infection do not need it, nor children. Well, I think is, it was true then, it's true now. But uh, some person on Twitter uh, decided to censor it. I was concerned with, so masks were very popular during the pandemic. I'm glad to, uh, that I can see all of your faces today, so that's nice. Uh, but one concern I had was that if all the people who are at high risk, they might go to a crowded restaurant or something, thinking they are protected with the mask when the mask provides zero to minuscule protection. And we know that from randomized trials. And I think some people died from COVID because of it. Uh, and therefore, uh, the scientist has to be truthful and honest with these things. This also uh, censored me, and I, I got uh, suspended uh, by twi Twitter for, uh, for about uh, a three-week period. Here was another on masks. Uh, uh, it was a very beautiful essay written by a, a professor of black studies at 
UC Santa Barbara, Roberto Strongman, uh, connecting it to Saint, Saint Anastasia, which is, which is an informal uh, Brazilian saint. Uh, she was a slave. And uh, she's depicted with the mask because they will often put masks on, on slaves. Uh, and so he said, master are symbols of submission, master the lurid fetish of power, mask lead to the ratio of personhood, mask promote a culture of fear, mask are deterrence of solidarity. And Twitter didn't like that post. So I had to be very careful with what I said on Twitter. And I talk, uh, I, I don't know, I, for what I think, well, if they're gonna censor me, why should I even be on Twitter? But a colleague of mine, a friend, whose family escaped the communism in Slovakia, and, uh, and her father and grandfather was both very active against the regime, uh, she told me that, no, no, you have to go back, and you, but you have to be careful, so you have, you have to push it as far as you can, but you have to be careful not to go over it, because you have to use whatever uh, communication tools that, that you can have. So that's what was convinced me that I needed to go, go back on Twitter. And then I tried to, uh, uh, tried to overcome it somehow. So, so I knew I, I had to be careful with what I wrote about mass, for example. So I wrote this, having been censored by Twitter, I must be careful with what I write about mask. And says, if you do surgery, please wear a surgical mask. It protects your patients. So if any of you are a surgeon here, I would strongly encourage you to wear a mask when you do surgery. I was also uh, uh, censored by uh, LinkedIn a number of times. I was suspended for a while. I was permanently suspended, but I got back because of some, some uh, media attention. I, I wrote with, uh, with Jay an op-ed in Newsweek, How Fauci Fooled America. And uh, interestingly, it was republished by uh, MSN, Microsoft News, which was uh, surprising but nice. Uh, I guess they have an arrangement with Newsweek. But it was also censored by LinkedIn, which is also owned by Microsoft. So Microsoft both republished this article and they censored it. Uh, number 10 principle is listen to the public. It's critical for public health scientists and officials always to listen to the public. They are the ones who are living in the public health consequences of public health decisions and, uh, and they have to adapt appropriately. So during the pandemic, a lot of public health officials were actually attacking and arguing regular people who were suffering from the lockdowns and you don't do that. Um, you have to listen to the public. Uh, otherwise, you're not a good, otherwise you shouldn't be in public health. And uh, these uh, are, I wrote a Twitter, uh, Twitter tweet sometime in 2020, I think, about principles of public health. And later on with some colleagues, including Scott Atlas and Jay Bhattacharya and others, we put together ethical principles of public health, uh, these 10 items which we uh, published as part of the Academy for Science and Freedom, which I am, uh, which I am part of. So uh, that is my presentation, and I thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, thank you.